Welcome to the podcast of the Ministry of Motion Pictures, where we seek to inspire Christian filmmakers, ignite a Christian film movement, and impact the new media landscape. I'm writer and director Todd Schaefer, and your host. My guest today is a pastor, theologian, an author, and an architect. His name is Scott Christensen, and he's here to talk about story. In a particularly dark moment in my life, I read a monstrous 700-page book on the problem of evil and the sovereignty of God. It was called What About Evil? and it was written by Scott. This book isn't light reading, not because it's not written well, but because it wrestles with some weighty subjects. And in the endorsements of the book, there are some stellar theologians who praise Scott's book for being both deep and accessible. And I'd have to agree, having read a lot of books on the problem of evil and the providence of God, Scott's book certainly had a much more readable character. Okay, so what does this have to do with story and Christian film? What is so fascinating about Scott's book is that he isn't just trying to find answers to difficult questions through academic tools, exegesis, word studies, and the like. The core component to how he seeks to answer the problem of evil is in our understanding of story. The Bible is God's story. It's sometimes called the drama of redemption. And in this book, Christensen spends considerable time explaining story and how important it is in helping us to wrestle with this theological issue. His grasp of story and service to theological truth is profound. He's widely read and quotes extensively from Aristotle, Milton, Tolkien, Lewis, Dostoevsky, Leland Riken, Brian Godawa, Northrop Fry, Andrew Claven, and many others. I knew I had to try to get him on the podcast, not only to talk about his book, but to discuss what storytelling advice he might have for Christian filmmakers. This is episode 49. Scott, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for joining us. Glad to be here. You were an architect for most of your career, and then you decided to go into ministry. What sparked that? (laughs) Um, Yeah. I felt, uh, you know, felt called into uh, to being an architect. I loved it. Uh, started uh, doing architectural work even when I was still in high school and um, graduated uh, with a degree in architecture, moved to Aspen, Colorado, uh, where I worked for a number of years and really loved what I was doing. Worked for a high profile architectural firm in Colorado, where we did a lot of, uh, you know, big, big homes for the rich and famous and, and did um, a lot of winter resort work, ski areas and mm. hotel, ski area facilities, uh, golf course facilities, all kinds of stuff like that. Absolutely loved it. But in the course of my career, just got involved in the life of our church, uh, was doing some teaching and leading a small group ministries and things like that. And through the course of that, just really began to sense God calling me into ministry and um, didn't leave my architectural career because I didn't like it anymore. I absolutely loved it. And uh, it was one of the most difficult decisions that I ever made was to leave that career and go into ministry. Mm. Um, So, so I did. And I love, I love what I do now too, (laughs) though sometimes I miss uh, being an architect. Uh, I do dabble in it a little bit. We're, we're actually doing a, an expansion project in our church right now that I had the opportunity to design. So I get to dabble in it a little bit, but my main passion now is to be a pastor, obviously. That, what a story. That's a, I mean, that's sort of the way it should happen. You know, we we mature and grow and then, then we transition into ministry as we get older and are more capable of taking on those responsibilities. It's a really interesting story. How many years were you an architect? 12, 13 years, you know, before the Lord led me into ministry. It's not an easy question to answer because I, I continue to work as an architect. And uh, and then I also worked in between pastoral positions. I, I worked for an architect in, in Arlington, Texas, where I actually designed churches for about a year. It was kind of in between ministries at that point. And so, you know, I, I practiced architecture at different points in my <laughs> life. So not only did you come at, come into ministry late, you started writing books on some incredibly difficult subjects. 
<laughs> such as free will, evil, and the sovereignty of God. What 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 motivated you to do that? And it, those books are, by the way, huge. They're not small books. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, the first book on free will uh, was was a topic that I really had been wrestling with for for most of my Christian life since I really kind of dedicated my life to studying the Bible when I was in, in my college years. And I had run across some friends that had challenged me to think about the issue of predestination and divine election and and all of that. And, and I came to accept that through my reading of scripture, but it still bothered me that what is this, what does this mean for our choosing, for our freedom of will? What does that even look like? Because we obviously make choices of our own volition. You know, we don't have this sense that we're being coerced, you know, to do something against our will. So how, how do we rectify yeah. those re And so, so that set me on a quest for a number of years to, to think through all that. And I just kind of maintained a running file computer of all my thoughts and things that I read, you know, passages of scripture or, or commentaries or, you know, that sort of thing. And then in my first pastorate in, in a small church in Southwest Colorado, I was started preaching to Ephesians and in Ephesians chapter one, obviously you're dealing head on with the question of divine election. And mm -hmm. so, so in the midst of teaching on that passage, I realized that my congregation were asking the same questions I was asking. Hmm. And so I did a series on, on the question of free will. And then about a year later, I started thinking this, this might be actually a good idea for a book. And so I started pitching the idea to some publishing friends of mine and, and then eventually landed a, a contract with PNR publishing and, and wrote the book. So yeah, it was, kind of an interesting process, uh, really grew out of my own passion for trying to understand the issues and, and through the pre and preaching through, you know, through Ephesians, essentially. That's how it yep. first forced on me. It was forced on me by mm. my, ed I never wanted to write a book about evil, but he <laughs> that it was a good idea because I touched the subject in the first book on free will, but I only, only just scratched the surface and so he convinced me I needed to write a whole book on it. So that set me on a quest, <laughs> on a whole new quest. Wow. To, to, and uh, it took me about five years to write that book, much longer than the free will book. Yeah, it's about, it's more than twice the size of, of your, your other book. I've got them both here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and it's that book, What About Evil, that sort of motivated me to get you on the show because the heart of the book, as you indicate in your introduction, are four chapters that seek to provide a framework to help us to understand the problem of suffering and evil in a world created by a sovereign God, which is what we call in theological cir circles theodicy. Three of those four chapters, you focused on the principles of storytelling. And it's within that framework of storytelling that you walk us through, you map out a biblical understanding of this problem of evil and suffering and, you know, God's a loving God and a sovereign creator God, uh, to give us a larger picture of what C.S. Lewis calls the one true story. And that story, that monomyth, as you call it, is, is echoed in many smaller stories throughout, throughout Scripture. So um, does that represent the heart of those chapters? Yeah, I think so. You know, one of the things that I mentioned in my book is that the Bible never provides us any kind of direct answer to the question mm -hmm. evil in the world. Yeah. It's not find a verse that says, and thus says the Lord, this is why I brought evil into the world or why right. I've allowed or whatever the case may be. And, uh, and so, you know, in grappling with the question, you know, it occurred to me that really the whole storyline of scripture is the answer to the problem of evil. Mm -hmm. And when, when you look and, and I like the fact that earlier on in, in the book, I, I treat our understanding of, of the nature of God's providence. And I think a good analogical model for the providence of God is the idea of a divine author. Um, now, some people don't like that language because it, it implies that God is the author of sin. Mm -hmm. 
author of evil. And in a sense, that is true. But in a qualified sense, it, it's it's kind of like Shakespeare writing Macbeth. He is not the direct cause of evil events that take place in Macbeth or evil character of his plays, for that matter. But he does write the stories. And so he includes evil in those stories because he is the one that is crafting you know, the whole story. And, and I think it's a good analogy to the providence of God. He is the divine author of all of history. So that includes good and evil that occurs within, within history and within the biblical storyline. And, and so if you read the Bible, I mean, you can clearly, and, and pretty much anyone who's read the Bible can see this pattern that, that the Bible begins with creation where everything is good, it is God declared it to be very good, and then suddenly we have this crisis that takes place in the fall with Adam and Eve, and that sets the trajectory for the rest of Scripture uh, in terms of God now addressing this conflict that is created in the Garden of Eden uh, in the whole story of redemption. So you have Mm -hmm. this pattern of creation, fall, and redemption that basically frames the whole story of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation that tells us the end of the story. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so as I began reflecting on that, I, I began to think, you know, that is the theodicy of the Bible. Mm-hmm. It's the Bible itself. It's the whole storyline of Scripture that God has authored, and He has meticulously planned each detail such that ultimately it brings glory to himself in a way that God could not otherwise bring glory to himself, as I try to spell out in the rest of the book. Mm, That's good. Yeah, so story helps us understand the scope of what God's doing, and all the pieces begin to fall together when you start looking at it from that perspective. Because if you're reading through Scripture, then, you know, there, there are moments that you think this is sort of random, but then when you look at the whole picture, you can see how that facet of that part of the Bible, which seems completely removed from it, anything, it's playing into the whole panorama of the larger story that God has us uh, involved in. I think what really turned me on to this whole uh, way of addressing the problem of evil was reading the works of Leland Riken, mm. who yeah. is a critic, a believer, who's written a lot of work on the literary qualities of the Bible. Mm -hmm. What is interesting is that most Bible scholars aren't really literary critics, or they don't look at the Bible through the lens of of a literary kind of way or, or, or through literary kinds of tools. They tend to look at the Bible through pure exegesis or syntax, you know, and that sort of thing at the, at the minimal level of construction sentences and meaning, you know, in terms of language in that sense, you know, or just strictly through a kind of theological kind of lens. But Leland Reichand has looked at the Bible more in a literary sense, and in reading his books really just opened up the whole issue of the story of the Bible, the whole storyline of Scripture, and how it mirrors stories that we hear our whole lives, you Mm -hmm. know, whether novel or in movies or in television shows or whatever the case may be. And then as I started exploring this idea further, I began to realize that all good stories follow the same pattern. Mm -hmm. They, with some kind of an ideal sort of situation, the way things ought to be, and then how some crisis, some conflict, you know, has crashed into that good, you know, ideal setting and created a problem, created a, a catastrophe, a, a, you know, as it is, as it were. And then the rest of the story is how that that conflict is is resolved. And so there's this constant conflict resolution motif in pretty much every good story that you ever watch, you know, on TV or in a movie or in a novel mm-hmm. or even so- their own stories. You know, as a pastor, you know, I will interview people for, you know, membership into our church. And so what we do is we ask them, tell us your story. You know, how did you come to Christ? Mm-hmm. And you, you know, they talk about the conflict that entered into their lives and sin and pain and suffering and how that led them 
to the resolution of that in their lives when they discovered Christ and, and God opened up the gospel to them. And so, you know, you see, you know, the experience of God's sovereign work in the broad storyline of scripture, you see it in a microcosmic kind of way in, in our own lives, mm -hmm. you know, how God brings us through crises and through sin and evil and suffering and pain and all of that, that comes as a result of the fall mm -hmm. and then be to invade our lives with hope through the resolution of all of those things in Christ and the gospel. And so, so it's just fascinating to me. And I think there's so much more that could even be explored in that regard that I, I touch on hardly in my, in my book. Would you say that, our sense of story is deconstructed from what God has purposed and planned for our lives and for his redemptive history. Well, I think that, you know, our common human experience and connected to our own lives, and as that's connected to the broader story of history and of scripture, it's a reflection of God having created us in his image. Mm -hmm. It was actually Eli Weissel, who's a, a Jewish survivor of the Holocaust, who said uh, God created uh, human beings to, I forget the, the quote exactly, created human beings to like stories because God is a storyteller or something like mm. that. Mm. And, uh, you know, we resonate with this particular model of, of how stories are told because that's what God is doing in reality. And so he's reflected that or, or caused that to resonate within every human being, I think, uh, because he's created us in his image. The problem is, is that we suppress the truth of the one true story, you know, that God has revealed in Scripture and co-opt it with false stories that are based on false worldviews, but I think still fit the pattern because whatever we perceive to be good and right and true is what we're going to fit into our worldview and whatever we perceive to be bad or evil or no good, you know, we're going to find a way to, to overcome that in our stories. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that every story that is told is a good story or a worthwhile story, because it may come from a worldview that distorts the truth. Nonetheless, I think it still reflects that pattern that that human beings are wired to find something good however they define the good in the midst of the evil that takes place because everyone experiences evil do you think that there is a need in theology to explore this more this idea of of story being part of our exegesis in putting things together do you see other art theologians doing that? You see it a little bit in biblical theology. You know, if you make some technical distinctions between, yeah. say, like systematic theology, systematic theology is sort of topical, right? It looks at different topics and then explores those topics, like the attributes of God or the character of man. And it searches scripture for all the scriptures that might speak to that particular topic. Biblical theology really is more along the lines of trying to understand the Bible as a whole. Right? And so there's been many scholars that have, you know, especially in recent years, probably in the last 20 years, especially, a lot of what, what you might call biblical theologies where, where theologians have looked at the whole sweep of biblical history and tried to trace out various themes and whatnot. And so I think you do see that happening, and, and I draw a little bit from some of those sources. But I think definitely there could be more, you know, more books, you know, or more treatments of those literary qualities. You know, I think Leland Riken does a great job of, of mm -hmm. out in his books, but he only, again, he only scratches the surface, you know, because mm -hmm. cause when you look at it, this pattern of, creation, fall, redemption, this, this sort of pattern of, of conflict resolution motifs are, are, are found even in individual stories of, of the Bible. You look at like the story of Joseph, right? He's the unlikely hero, this bratty kid who, you know, who his brothers hate and try to kill, you know, ends up becoming the hero of the story. David, you know, this punk little kid, you know, who's supposed to be out helping the sheep ends up defeating the great Goliath, you know, the great enemy of Israel. Mm 
You know, so you see that motif in, in all the stories. You see it in Jesus's parables. If you look at the Good Samaritan, you know, the, the, you know the, the Samaritan people were hated by the Jews. So he, he becomes the most unlikely person you would ever expect to do something good, you know, to the, the person that's gotten beat up and left on the side of the road for dead, uh, you know, or, or the, the prodigal son story. Uh, you know, just amazing storytelling. Jesus himself was a great storyteller, mm -hmm. uh, his parables. And he mirrors that whole conflict resolution motif that I think is part of any good story. And uh, because it's, it's God ordained, it's, it's, it reflects God himself, reflects what he is doing with the whole gamut of history from creation, fall, redemption and the ultimate resolution when Christ returns and establishes his kingdom forever. I've often wondered why story, when it can be so useful as a tool, why the church has sort of drifted away from it or not embraced it, because we, we do historically enjoy certain things like Pilgrim's Progress is, is lauded as one of the greats. Um, we see C.S. Lewis coming along and doing stories. But in, in our churches, we, we sort of push all the story and artistic parts to our kids. So when they're in Sunday school or children's church or something like that, they're dealing with stories or dealing with art, but we sort of grow out of that and leave that all behind. And not, not to say that we shouldn't have teaching because scripture is very clear. We need to be about preaching and teaching the gospel and the word of God. But somewhere in there, especially in such an entertainment driven culture like we have, um, don't you think that the, or do you think that the church should embrace more storytelling methods and not necessarily specifically in church, but just as a Christian culture, be supporting more arts and storytelling to communicate God's truth, to put it on display, to use those avenues that we have so prevalent in our culture? Yeah, I, I, I think so. It, it, it's sort of baffling to me to think about how so many Christians have become sort of second rate, if you will, in mm -hmm. ability to tell good stories. You would think mm -hmm. Christians would be the best storytellers like Tolkien or, or C.S. Lewis or, you know, John Bunyan or John Milton. You know, I mean, we used to have those kinds of people. And so I don't know what it is really about modern culture that has caused Christians to despise the arts. You see it. In the visual arts, you see it, and even in contemporary Christian music, you know, all of the great groundbreaking works of art, whether it be in music or visual arts or whatever, are always unbelievers. And Christians are seeming to follow, you know, yeah. follow the of unbelievers. I don't want to suggest that there's not something to be gained from what we see in the unbelieving world, because once again, I think it reflects general revelation and that God has revealed himself in these patterns that we often see in good storytelling, you know, because it's, it's not just the Christian, it's not just a reflection of, of the truth in, in the believer, it's a reflection of a broader truth in the Imago Dei, you know, mm -hmm. in God creating us in his image, that human beings just by their nature resonate with this particular storytelling motif of conflict resolution. You know, we're looking for heroes. We may be looking for them in the wrong places, but it's just interesting to me that, that many unbelievers have, you know, are very good storytellers, and yet we don't find too many Christians, you know, that are good storytellers anymore how to answer that question because it, it is a, <laughs> especially when we're in an age where even christians are writing all these novels and whatnot but they tend to be sappy romance things or ever that i don't think really employ some of the powerful s storytelling plots and techniques that i think you often see in the secular world we used to be the ones who were shaping the arts and culture uh, centuries ago, but now we've sort of lost it. We've given it over to the world, I guess. And it, it's something I wrestle with too. I, I don't have an answer as to why, where are the C.S. Lewis's of today? Where are this, where are the um, John Bunyan's of today? We, we don't. I mean, when we talk about good Christian artists, we're always reaching back into history to people who are dead. Why is it so difficult for us to 
create works of art that are not just serving the church, but also beautiful to the world, or at least admired to the world for its, its artistic value. Yeah. And I think a lot of it is that there's just not a deep and powerful reflection upon scripture in, in the modern church the way that there used to be, I think, you know, because the Bible is so rich with imagery and a, a paradigm, if you will, for just fantastic storytelling and the ability to represent, you know, some amazing truths in mm. visual arts, musical arts, and so forth. Mm. And if we do have a rich history of, of some of that in the hymn writing and Messiah type oratorios and things like that in musical history, box, heritage or whatever. But yeah, we're missing that today. And I don't know quite how we got there, but, but there has been a dumbing down of the intellectual firepower that I think Christianity long held. And I don't know if that's a result of the enlightenment and it's, it's doling of Christianity in that regard where there's been this shift toward upholding secularism as a basic mm -hmm. worldview um, and Christians have not been able to recapture that. I'm not sure, but, uh, but it is an interesting phenomenon. Yeah. I like the way you put that. Um, if you were to address a room full of Christian filmmakers who are writers, what are some of the things you've learned that you could offer to them, either motivate them or encourage them or direct them to what they should be doing? I, I think, don't be afraid to write stories that jump outside the box a little bit. I think a lot of, you know, Christian movies use a, a certain kind of formula that I think inhibits their ability to tell good stories or why that is. But, you know, I think there's too much of a cookie cutter kind of uh, way of treating stories in a too sanitized kind of way. Mm -hmm. I think actually embracing the ugliness and the messiness and the brokenness of the world as it really is needs to be more a part of the way stories are told. You know, too often the characters that are too sanitized as if you have the, the clear before and after. Oh, yeah, I was this terrible sinner and now I'm this perfect little Christian and I do all these good things. But that's not really how life is. I mean, even as believers, we struggle with sin. We struggle with pain and suffering, and we struggle with how to respond to pain and suffering. And so I think there's something very powerful to be found in reflecting reality. And we should do that by going back to scripture. I mean, look at, for example, the life of David. Here you have a great hero of scripture, and yet he had this fall in the midst of his very good life, very God-blessed life, and yet in the midst of that, he fell into deep sin, and it had profound consequences for him throughout the rest of his life. Th th things were never the same in his kingdom ever again. And he experienced the consequences of his own sin as a believer, as a faithful follower of the God of the Bible. And yet he experienced kind of a tragic end, if you will. I mean, David's life doesn't really end very well in mm -hmm. that sense. A, he's kind of a tragic figure in some ways. Um, and, and so, you know, there isn't always a tidy ending to every story, even in Scripture. And I think ultimately there is that hope that the good ending is there for the believer mm -hmm. because of the redemptive work of Christ. But in this life, we realize it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to, you know, that full work of redemption does not occur in this lifetime. And I think that even for the believer, it, it should cause us to yearn even more mm -hmm. for the second Christ and the glorification and the perfection that he will bring, you know, where he completely um, resolves all of the conflicts of death and suffering and pain and evil and sin and, and, and all the misery that it brings to this present life. And I think more of that should be reflected in Christian storytelling because it causes us to long all the more for the good ending that ultimately is coming. And even tragic stories, not every good story is a comedy in the sense that it has a good ending. 
some stories don't have the perfect ending. They have a, a tragic ending, but even those tragic endings should point us to the even deeper longing for the good ending. I talk a little bit about that in my book as well. Mm-hmm. It, uh, so I think Christian writers, filmmakers should explore that. And then when they're writing their characters, they need to be compelling. One of the reasons why I think so many Christian movies and novels just aren't very enjoyable is because the characters aren't real. Mm-hmm. Sanitized, they're too yeah. artificial, plastic. Many people are probably familiar with the, the Chosen series of movies that are being made. There's a, there's a lot that could be said about that. But one one good thing that I do think that those series of shows do is they they do very good characterizations. I mean, if you look at the character of Matthew or Peter in that show, I think they're wonderful characters. They've done a really good job of making Peter and Matthew come alive and be real people, you know, with very interesting characteristics and the acting in in that show is done very well. Mm -hmm. Uh, Other things that I would criticize about the the (laughs) characterization, you know, is really good. And I think there's not enough of that in Christian movie making anyway. I'm so glad you said that. I mean, that hits the nail right on the head. I think we are too given to the Hollywood cookie cutter kind of framework. And then we do it in such a simplistic way. And I don't think we're thinking deeply enough about the characters and the conflict and the reality of sin and the battle that we have in this life. And this life is about groaning. It's not about victory uh, from, from a meaning that everything's tied up with a nice little bow at the end. And so I think there is that superficiality where Christian storytellers tend to make the ending fit uh, some sort of preconceived idea that doesn't really reflect what's real in life. And I find that there's a lot of really good, unbelieving filmmakers and storytellers who do that great, and Mm -hmm. yet they don't have the theological understanding they're just looking at reality and saying what's true where christians could be looking at the reality portraying what's really there and then making it meaningful to an audience in a way that helps them to live this life so i think you're absolutely on the money with your your observation there and i'm so glad you you spotted that (laughs) god thank you so much for being on my podcast and uh sharing your your perspective I think your book, What About Evil, is really a very important book for writers to read because you blend the whole thing together. You, you, I mean, we're dealing with some of the issues that create the conflict, the suffering, the evil, and how do you reconcile that with the Holy God? And then right in the middle of it, you've got the storytelling components that help to map things. And I think a thoughtful Christian filmmaker can can gain so much just from reading your book on writing more developed, deeper stories that reflect reality and tackle more profound truth. So I I thank you for your book for that. It's, it's not just for Christians for, for storytelling. It's, it's for everybody because it deals with an essential problem that, that we grapple with all the time. And, you know, I thank you for your book. You're welcome. Yeah. I hope it has a, a deeper impact for people. Um, in the in the coming days, I, um, I've I've had a lot of testimonies of people that that have gone through a lot of hardship in their lives and have written me to share how how the book has had an impact on them. Yeah, but for the first, it has really drawn out um, this storytelling aspect of 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 the book, and uh, and that really is very central to um to my whole thesis about how uh the theodicy of scripture unfolds and so so i'm glad you have drawn attention to it so what's your next book (laughs) um (laughs) yeah i don't know i have some ideas floating around in my mind but i'm taking a little bit of a, a writing break for a while i've been writing you know using all of my spare time to write for the last really the last seven, eight years. And, and so, so I'm on a little bit of a hiatus, but I do have some ideas percolating. Those are some weighty books that you've done. So yeah, it's a well-deserved break. <laughs> Scott, thank you so much for being on the program. I really appreciate your time and work. Thanks Todd for having me. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Scott Christensen, and I highly recommend you buy this book to be part of your screenwriting library. 
something that sits alongside Aristotle, Robert McKee, Richard Walter, and Lajo Zegri. You can find a link to Scott's book in the show notes on our website. Thank you for joining me on this episode of the Ministry of Motion Pictures podcast. I hope this has been both inspiring and edifying. And if you wish to support the ministry and keep these podcasts going, you'll find information about how you can do that on our website at ministryofmotionpictures.org. What we do in life echoes in eternity.